Jacob Davis, inventor of the riveted garment, was also a master tailor. And the prime example of the type of pants he wanted to make can be found in the 19th century bell bottoms, spring bottom pants. In this episode, we'll look at six American dream stories, the men who made it rich from mining in the gold rush. Welcome to Denim Denim, the channel where we explore Levi's vintage and denim culture. Big shout out to my Patreon members. Join the community and support the channel, get extra features, or hit me up with a super thanks one time. Super big thanks to Fitzsanu Boone Prosert. Like, subscribe, and share. Now on with the video. In researching the minor stories for the 1870 Duck episode, I found a few amazing tales of success and adventure, and I needed to share somewhere. This is the last episode dealing with miners. 1870, the unnamed miners who got scammed. 1873, the solution to one of the miners' many woes. 1878, the companies that sold goods to miners. 1880s, blue gold, modern denim miners. And 1886, the failed miners turned out laws. Now, for the spring bottom pants. A garment meant for middle management at the turn of the century We'll explore the tales of those who obtained wealth from the mines. Samuel Brannan. Okay, I need to start off with this guy. First of all, he begins the whole gold rush at Sutter's Mill thing. And his factual story is much more far-fetched than any fiction. Samuel Brannan moved from New York to California in 1846 to spread the Mormon religion. He was an energetic entrepreneur, and his extracurricular activities would wind up getting him excommunicated. Nevertheless, he had plans in California. He owned a general store and acres of land near Sutter's Mill. In 1847, his crew found some gold flakes. He instantly opened a second general store in the area and went to San Francisco to spread the gold fever religion. Within months, three quarters of the male population would head for the hills. And the following year, Folks from all over the world would line up on ships and wagons headed to California. Samuel Brennan never actually dug for gold, and there is no evidence that he had found as much as he rambled on about. He claimed it would take 50 years to dig up all the gold he saw, but the region would be mined dry in less than a decade. His plan was to lure new customers, then jack up prices based on his geographical monopoly. In 1850, his stores pulled in $5,000 a day. That's over $180,000 U.S. dollars in 2023. Each day. This made him the richest man in California. He bought up a slew of properties in San Francisco and a few thousand acres of land in Napa Valley. Then, he went all super villain. He started enforcing his own vigilante law against foreigners. He tried to overthrow the king of Hawaii. He got in a bar fight with some of his employees and they shot him. Eight times. But the story doesn't end yet. His wife divorced him in 1870, and that required him to liquidate what was left of his failing fortune. For the next 17 years, he was running failed land grab schemes in Mexico. His only source of income was selling pencils door to door. In 1890, he returned to San Francisco. The paper was recorded him as an old, gray, broken in strength, able only to get about with the aid of a cane. The only keenness of the eye alone shows that his spirit has survived the decay of his body. This next man can be featured in Deadwood, and is by far the most successful story on the list. He began an empire that exists to this day and is synonymous with opulence and power. George Hurst at least had an interest in mining. He would observe local miners in Missouri and read what books he could find about different minerals. When gold struck in California, he sold his family farm and headed west. At first, Hurst fell victim to the general store scams run by Brannon. So, he headed downriver and opened his own general store to become the scammer. This made him a rich man. 
Hearst uses wealth to buy up land and mining operations in South Dakota. Deadwood, if you are familiar with it. And this is the single largest gold haul in the mining in the USA. And it served to make the wealthy even richer. Hearst's legacy would be decided one night at a poker game when he won a newspaper. His son, being an avid comic book reader, took an interest in the newspaper and made it into the publishing empire that it became. The character George Hearst can be seen in Deadwood Season 2. And of course, his son William Randall Hearst is the subject for Citizen Kane. Not all that bad, but a bit foolish, is the story of Horace Tabor. In his earlier days, he accompanied John Brown in the abolitionist cause. Horace became a merchant too, eventually giving supplies to a pair of young men in exchange for one-third of their mining claim. Luckily, this claim struck silver and provided the Tabers with sudden wealth. Horace Tabor used his newfound wealth to start several other mining companies, eventually becoming a very wealthy businessman. However, he was also a reckless spender. Tabor's notoriety was cemented after he divorced his wife, marries his mistress, Baby Doe. As soon as he marries Baby Doe and loses his fortune in the divorce, then 1893, Silver collapsed and he was left penniless. Both of them broke. He's dead by 1899. Wrongly insisting his mines would again become profitable. He's known as the Silver King of Leadville. He spent lavishly on his home, the Tabor Opera House, the matchless mines, Baby Doe's Cabin, and these are all tourist attractions that you can help tell the story if you want to visit now. He became a U.S. Senator, philanthropist, promoting the arts. The movie Silver Dollar, 1932, is based on Tabor and his scandalous affair with Baby Doe. It stars Edward G. Robinson. She... Based on the characters in this list, Thomas Walsh was a pretty boring guy. He had no scandals. And his success was based on methodically predicting which claims would pay out. Once he achieved his wealth, he hobnobbed with kings and presidents. He used his wealth to build Colorado. Most importantly, he paid his miners more than any union fought for. He respected the workers. Thomas Walsh seems like a hero, but this really left him without record notoriety for the years. Thomas Walsh and this next guy just get washed up into history and forgotten about. If ever there were a rags to riches American dream story, then this is the one. John McKay was an Irish immigrant who headed west as a youth in search of carpentry work for miners in the west. His primary motivation was providing for his mother and siblings. After six years of being a $4 a day laborer in the mines, he invested in buying a plot of land to mine himself. He kept swapping it for better pieces until he got a slice of the Comstock load. In 1866, he struck gold, silver, and quartz, 76 million inches below the surface. He would use his fortune as a philanthropist. He never achieved the same success in mining again, but he would still pursue other mining ventures. His great social contribution was to establish the telegraph lines in the West and even throughout the Pacific Islands. He is known as the nice guy of the tycoons, perhaps because he gave generously to charities and he had a wonderful demeanor about him that people loved. But in examining his character, he seems to have had quite the temper. He was frustrated with failed endeavors and was ready to drop everything to fight some dude. This could lend to the complexity of the human character, where the bar to be a 19th century nice guy was just very low. This next one is amazing. The descendant of aristocracy, but born into slavery. Already by his teens, he had an exorbitant list of accomplishments throughout the West. A blacksmith, a wrangler, a fur trader. Then he joined the Crow Nation and became one of their top generals. He volunteered to fight in America's wars as well, against the Seminole in Florida and against Mexico in 1846. It's said he took 1,800 horses from Mexican soldiers as spoils. 
Then the gold rush happened and he set off to San Francisco. He was actually smart enough not to go for the mining, but to open a general store. First in Sonoma and then in Sacramento. By this time, he spent most of his days as a professional card player. Then he opened a ranch that you can still visit to this day. I guess being a soldier was his main thing as he returned to fight for the US against other tribes during the Civil War and then dying in 1867. His death remains a mystery. The US Army's position is that he was poisoned by the crow who thought that he was no longer trustworthy. Heck of a story here. If you want more of Jim Beckworth, you can check out the movie The Harder They Fall and season one, episode three of Into the Wild Frontier does him a little more justice with historical accuracy. But there still needs to be an entire miniseries to explore all of his many adventures that he had within his life. Jim Beckworth stands as a hero within this episode. Alkali Ike. Was this the Virginia City miner that requested Jacob Davis make a pair of pants where the pockets don't rip? Methinks not. But it's still a fascinating story and a core element of the 501 saga. Who was Alkali Ike? Let's look at the historical evidence in chronological order. 1858, a song, Betsy from Pike. We have the lines, The alkali desert was burning and bare, and Isaac's soul shank from the death that lurked there. Ike, being the diminutive for Isaac, is used throughout the rest of the song. But we still don't have that Alkali Ike moniker yet. 1909. Character at a Wild West show in Alaska. 1912. Banjo playing Augustus Carney silent films. There's a hit song, The Alkali Ike Rag. There's even an episode called Alkali Ike's Pants. This circa 1911 photo of a drunkard named Alkali Ike from Deadwood, North Dakota. He was never a character on the TV show, but he does have a tour company in the real Deadwood town named after him. There are Alkali Ike comic books, this one from the 19-teens, and then in the 1940s, this one. It takes place in Texas, and he is a gold miner. He doesn't enter the Levi story until the 1960s, when he's featured as a character in the comic novel about Mr. Strauss and blue jeans. There are so many other historical errors in this that it's all suspect. 1970s, the first blue jeans ad. We can see Alkali Ike as the first miner Jacob Davis made the riveted pants for, but that's it. We never hear about Alkali Ike once there is a Levi's historian. The story of the wife whose husband needed stronger pants and he was too sick or busy to come get measured has been more canonical and also used within the 150th with the blessing of Levi's historian Tracy Panic. Let's do the math. We see a picture of a man in his 60s or 70s in 1911 in South Dakota named Alkali Ike. He would have been in his 20s or 30s in 1870. He could have been married by that age and been a minor in Nevada. He could have moved to Texas and then to South Dakota over the decades and ended up as a drunk who also inspired a guitar playing Wild West show character for stage and film. This would make him the Forrest Gump of the Old West. Were there just several dudes with the same moniker just rolling around? What do I make of Alkali Ike? I think he's one of those semi-legendary characters. The nickname Alkali Ike was probably attributed to many a mining folks with the first name Isaac. The story of a few of them got mixed around over a couple decades into a stage character. The subsequent film increased the popularity, and from there, it entered the social consciousness. Not being as famous as, say, his stage fellow Wild Bill or Annie Oakley, he was relegated to mysterious circumstances and free to take the placeholder of any other Old West story. Then, the Levi story needed a minor. On the first, the author could grab was good old Alkali Ike. I think both Ike's story and the wife who went to see Jacob Davis are both stories that should be taken with a grain of salt. We really don't have enough records. 
and perhaps the master tailor that was Jacob Davis, just figured out the rivet on his own between customers. It doesn't really matter. We have the results and we have a story. Sometimes you have to choose your own adventure in history. Most 501 stories are going to talk about Mr. Strauss, and there's a lot to him. But if capitalism granted equal credit, then we'd probably all possibly be wearing Jake's by now. Jacob Davis is the inventor of the riveted garment. And he wanted to craft a pair of pants with stitching that made it both functional for the tough jobs the men wearing them endured, plus had stylish curves to show off the workmanship of his time. We've looked at examples of the double X'd waist overalls, pantaloons, and now his most ornate garment yet, the spring bottom pants. These were not made for miners wading in the water or with their butt cheeks pressed against a rock. The special quality of the pantaloons is that they had a second layer of denim in the butt and knees. Pants for working men. Nope, the spring bottom pants are a whole new breed. Them's is made for middle management. The sellouts who got promoted to rat out their former cronies. The kind of men who were still on the working floor, but made frequent visits to the executive's office. Spring bottom pants are still made of denim. In fact, they were made of double X denim and in a cheaper version, just like the 501s and 201s. But I believe this piece is really Davis's magnum opus. The rivet is what made him rich and put him in the history books. The spring bottom pants are what he did once he had the creativity and backing to do whatever he wanted. He wanted to make a garment that fit in the style of the time and showed off the curved stitching that only an experienced tailor could do. Davis was particularly proud of the spring bottom pants and that's why he put on most of the advertising for the company at the time. A brief history of flared pants. There are some styles that come and go over time, like undulating waves. Flared ankle pants are one of those. While it is most synonymous with the 1970s, when they were known as bell bottoms, flared pants have had many rises and falls throughout the centuries. Remember, pants were not worn in the ancient world, except by horse riding nomads in the steppe region. By the Middle Ages, pants were common throughout Europe, and many carpenters wore flared pants to keep their ankles free from sawdust on the floor. American sailors were the first to adopt bell bottom trousers in the 19th century. Possibly because flares made it easier to snag a man who had fallen overboard and easier to remove when wet. From sailors, the trend caught on throughout the 1800s, and this is the style Jacob Davis gave to his unique pair of pants. There are some firsts with this pair. The idea was that you would go to your tailor and tell them how much spring you wanted in your pants. Do you want boot cut or disco stew? This meant more personalization in the garment. The spring bottom pants came out in 1889, a year before the 501s. At the time, it was advertised more prominently than the 501s. Levi sold spring bottom pants for over 20 years until discontinuing them in 1911. In 1900, Levi's introduced them in a black denim model. That's right. Black denim 55 years before Elvis made it popular. The public would have to wait half a century for the return of flared pants. In addition, there were a few other unique features. Instead of steel buttons, it had brass, which comes off looking like shiny gold. Absolutely gorgeous. Some spring bottom pants had square leather patches on the right side, just like the 501s, but most would have the emblematic triangular patch that sits in the middle. Now this tends to be hidden once the cinch is tightened. That's why they put it up even higher. And what a cinch it is. Notice the natural curvature of the cinch and how it bends with the curved pocket stitching. The pockets come to a teardrop in the middle, almost like the arcuate. Just like the pantaloons, we have the M-shaped rear waistline for the executive style. Spring bottom pants come with lining on the inside. 
Some with this fun candy cane striping. We can see in the historic pricing catalog that they would have cost 30% more than the 501s. They received prominent lot numbers too. Not 501, but 5 and 1. 5 meaning best quality, and the third digit 1 for the prime items in that lot series. Lot numbers 511 for blue gold denim, 512 for bigger sizes, and 513 for youths. That's right, for the 12 year old middle managers or something. 521 for gray denim and 522 for bigger sizes of gray denim. 531 for black denim and 532 for extra sizes. And then there would have been a lot two series for a cheaper denim version. The variation of denims offered in the spring bottom pants models seems to show off all the variety of denim fabrics Levi's was using. While they didn't make them in double X, there was a cheaper version, a black, a gray, but for the spring bottom pants, you have this special blue gold denim, which is basically a pair of blue pants, but you can see a lot of these gold threads throughout it. The recreated variations all seem to be from 1910, just at the end of the run. One pair is labeled 1919, but that would have been 18 years after they stopped making them, so just incorrectly labeled. Usually I would title the episode year after the LVC recreation year, which would be 1910 for this. However, 1889 was the year Spring Bonnet Pants first came out, and I think in the context with the minor stories, it really comes to a completion with that. The black, gray, and blue gold comes in rigid pairs with guarantee tickets for the spring bottoms and possibly a tote bag. The blue gold is the original. It is meant to show off California pride and it really resembles the idea of the Gilded Age out west. There's a gray and these have a wonderful executive touch and something to distinguish yourself from the rest. Remember, you're probably working with a lot of other people wearing blue denim at this time. Then there's the black. This is the item that reflects the new materials and changing times Levi's would go through. From Jacob Davis to Elvis to Punk. All of these are incredibly rare pairs and you'd be lucky to have any one of them. But the limited edition is a blue gold distressed archival piece. This is the limited edition piece that comes in a box. Customized stains on knee and thigh, and 1,000% immaculate. Now, some folks prefer rigid, but others really dig the distressed. Which are you? There's also this pair of 691s, which are pre-LVC. That's right, from before 1996, late 80s, early 90s, by their all-duty line. And you can see a lot of the same details from the spring bottom pants put into these. Letters are a big part of Levi's history, and this channel, and especially the 501 saga. I don't exactly have a letter for this, but I do have a fragment of a letter from the Levi's archives. This letter was written in 1889, to one of the retail customers in Wyoming. We have taken the liberty of adding one dozen of our patent riveted spring bottom pants, being something new in that line, and we are sure that you will find them very desirable. There is already quite a demand for them on all sides. We enclose a size list for same. I really have to say, these are a pair that grew on me. I wasn't too into them years ago when I started to get into LVC, but I have a new appreciation since starting this channel, doing the research of them, and just examining how epic it is to have these gold touches on a pair of jeans, expressing the gold rush interest, the Gilded Age, the Wild West, but also they are a, a fancy pair of pants that even if they're in your size, 
not too many places you can wear them. I think you could still slip them on and be wearing them any place. These are made of denim. I know it looks like they're not. They looks more like a pair of chinos or something, but these are made of nine ounce denim from the time. This has been a really fun episode to make. To all you, thanks for watching. Help out the channel, give a like, subscribe, Patreon channel, super thanks. It all just goes into making better production videos and getting more time to make the videos. Next, we're back to the 501s. You can check out the 1890 video already. 1901 is coming, and we'll be in the 20th century from now on. I'm Dan. Thanks for watching. Love your jeans.